Okay, my name's Tom Zabriski. Welcome to this OSDOX event on short docos. And welcome to our audience that are watching this via live streaming. Um, before we begin, I wish to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and to all Aboriginal people and elders, past and present. This land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Okay, so we are the Oslox Documentary Forum, and we hold monthly events here at the film school. Um, you can get news of future events simply by getting onto our website, osdocs.org. Um, you can even catch up on past events because we've got podcasts on that site. And if you're really interested and want to get involved, is that we've got a vol volunteer committee and meet, we meet twice, three times a year. So we very much would welcome your participation. If that's what you want to do, it'd be great. We always want volunteers, committee members. So uh, tonight, um, we're going to invite your participation um, via Twitter as well as here in the audience. Um, and you're going to be recorded <laughs> for our podcast later. Um, so I just want to, before we actually start, to thank Afters for supplying the theatre. Uh, the ADG, the Australian Directors Guild, for their ongoing support of Ausdocs. Um, Brendan Toole for his fantastic poster art. <laughs> um, okay, I think we've done with all that. <laughs> so let's get to tonight's business, which is um, short documentaries. And we've got five people on the panel. And I just want to introduce everybody. Um, Thanks so much for coming and being involved. And you've just heard from Bronwyn, or well, those who haven't on the stream haven't. But anyway, Bronwyn Kidd, the Executive Director of Flickrfest, the International Short Film Festival. Um, Flickrfest is the largest short film festival in Australia, and it's now in its 27th year. Um, so every year, Bronwyn curates short film programs for the festival and for its, for its national touring program. And she has also funded a distribution business that represents over 200 Australian short films worldwide. Next to Bronwyn, um, Joe, Joe Chichester, uh, executive producer, ABC TV Arts. Joe began her career in Triple J before moving to the ABC a decade ago. She has worked on a range of programs in arts, comedy, entertainment. She's got several half-hour and one-hour series in production, well, in the pipeline, <laughs> and in production. Yeah. Um, and the feature film that she commissioned right here, fun Finding the Go-Betweens, uh, is going to be premiering at this year's Sydney Film Festival. A different title now. Oh, a different title. I need to update that. <laughs> you can update that later. Okay, fantastic. Um, and Joe's the commissioning editor of Art Bites and will be showing a one of the films and a short film in, in one of the series that was funded. Um, so next to Joe is Brooke, Brooke Silcox. Hi, Brooke, great that you can come, fantastic. Um, you came all the way from Perth? <laughs> I have, yeah. Um, you got an emerging producer initiative, yeah? Yes. From Screen West yeah. um, to develop a slate of documentary film, TV, VR projects, and You've currently got an internship with Felix Media. Yep. Yeah. Um, and she was involved in an Arts Bites, well, you produced the Arts Bites series, Home, The Art of Ian Strange. Yeah, we're going to see an episode of that later. And um, the interesting thing in your CV was that your background was in banking and financing. <laughs> You're actually a lawyer. <laughs> Very uh, useful <laughs> skills going into the film industry, I think. <laughs> I started off as an artist and then... I decided I needed to buy a new car, and so I thought I should retrain in a job that would um, <laughs> provide me enough money to buy a new car. So <laughs> I, I um, yeah. studied law, and then um, I have come back into film again. Yeah. Right. Okay. We'll yeah. hear more about all that later. Um, uh, next to Brooke is Jessica Douglas Henry, an old mate. <laughs> um, more than 30 years' experience in the film and TV industry. Um, she is a multi-award winning producer and director of factual programs. 
She's currently series producer for Compass, and she's got a very talented team. And you're producing around 37 episodes of television yeah, of per those, year. Yeah, of those, um, 24 are produced internally, but we do we do 13 acquisitions a year, which is kind of where the the uh, the, the short film element comes in. Yeah. Great. Well, yeah. we'll hear about that more later. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, Dave Rockach, um, director of Antenna, a documentary festival. Yeah here in Sydney held every October, still October, David, hasn't changed, yeah. good. Um, well, your first edition was in 2011, mm -hmm. and you seem to be going from strength to strength now, yeah? Yes. Um, it's great, and the festival is very much de dedicated to promoting the work of emerging filmmakers. And each year, you run a competition in, for the best Australian documentary short film. Yes, we only yeah. screen on Australian shorts. You only screen Australian films, but you do screen more than Australian films in, in overall, don't you? Uh, in terms of shorts, we... Um, oh, shorts, only Australians, right? Yes, so okay. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Yeah, tell me later, tell us later, great. Now, I'm really hoping we're going to fit in um, an interview with a person who's not here, whom I recorded in Melbourne at the AIDC. Um, uh, it's with Charlie Phillips, and Charlie is the commissioning editor of Guardian Documentaries. And the Guardian documentaries actually commissioned short films from around the world. It would be, I think, great to, to hear from Charlie. He's looking for, for Australian doc docs. Okay, so I just want to maybe just say a couple of very short things before we kick off. Um, um, I mean, short docs can mean many things to, to many people. I mean, I think... <sighs> I think just about every filmmaker in this room has started off making a short documentary, really, as a stepping stone to um, making a longer film. Um, many of us who make feature docs wish we'd actually be going back making short films again, <laughs> knowing just how massive the task of making larger films is. Um, but in terms of short documentaries, I, I don't think there's only one form, one star, one way of making short docs. I think they, some of them evolve over months, years perhaps. Some of them can be made very quickly um, to a brief. Um, so the whole spectrum. Uh, it's, it's a kind of storytelling that actually is not that easy. It takes skill to um, make a, a film, a short film, about the human condition, about the world, you know, to encapsulate um, something larger um, in a short space of time, using all the means that the filmmakers have at their disposal um, in, ev in any style, whether it be op-doc, as you've seen, in anything down to an animation. Um, personally, uh, I, I do a bit of teaching here at Film School. I ran a, I ran a, a master class in docos, and I quite often show what's one of my favourite uh, local Australian short films. It's called Salt, just called Salt. It's in the library here at Afters, and it's made by filmmaker Mick Angus about the photographer Murray Fredericks and his journey <laughs> across the salt pans of Lake Eyre. It's a very poetic film. It's, it's be beautifully crafted. And I think it's just an example of just how, how great short docs can be. And doc that film actually ended up on television, on the ABC. It did, yeah. It did. It nice, it but nice. it was originally funded through Screen Australia, I think through the Signature Fund initiative quite a while ago. Um, okay, just the final point I want to make, um, funding. Interesting. Preparing this um, forum, you know, one tends to think short films, yeah, they do get uh, self-funded, but actually there are opportunities and incentives for people actually to be paid. <laughs> to be commissioned, you know, to get some money for, for what they do. And um, w some of these, the panellists, particularly Joe and Jessica, will be talking uh, to that tonight. Um, but lastly, um, short docs exist both on the sh small screen and on the big screen, as you've seen tonight. And um, I think it's very appropriate to start off with this film, um, in a way. Um, so I want to throw it to you, Bronwyn, <laughs> because, you know, it's great to, to watch a film, any film, particularly short film, on the big screen. So I just want to ask you to maybe just talk in general about Flickerfest and 
perhaps just to talk about the kinds of films that make it into the competition, because there must mm. be a heap of films yeah. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. that that, uh, that get offered to you. <laughs> Definitely. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've been doing Flickr Fest for 20 years now, and I'm originally a documentary filmmaker myself. I made a couple of films for SBS way back uh, in the day, pre-sold to SBS. So when I came to Flickr Fest 20 years ago, I had a, apart from loving film in general, I had a particular passion for documentary, and I really wanted to introduce a short documentary competition at Flickr Fest that would be separate um, to the fiction films that we presented every year because um, generally when you go to short film festivals around the world you'll th see the docos thrown in there um, in the mix with the um, more the live action and animated films and I was really keen to give them their own spotlight um, and so in introducing the program it was really to celebrate brave adventurous and compelling documentaries from here in Australia and around the world. So we have a mix within our two programs of, um, we have a particular doco day at Flickr Fest where we celebrate um, Australian and international short documentary films. And we do get an enormous amount of entries. Um, we are Academy qualifying for the short documentary category and we're also BAFTA recognized. So um, that really bumps up the entries that we receive from across the world and indeed from here in Australia each year so um, what we're looking for and as you can imagine 16 short films is not a lot um, when you love documentaries and you're trying to put a program together so it's a, it's probably the toughest um, competition that we have in Flickrfest in fact because we do have six programs of Australian short films so about 60 something other Australian short films that we screen in competition in the live action and animation categories and we of course also have an international program as well so the two documentary competition programs are extremely difficult um, to be selected for and um, probably the most painful decisions that we have to make really because we do see some really exceptional short films but um, being academy qualifying I guess one of the things for us is to be diverse so to show a range of films from a range of countries and to be uh, diverse not just in the cultures that are represented but also to be diverse within the styles and genres of the films and um, one of the things that I still get excited about 20 years on in doing Flickrfest and um, in particular in putting together the documentary programs are the incredibly diverse, brave, fresh and inspirational films that come through every year. I think that the great thing about short docs is that you can be particular, you can push the boundaries and you're not so constrained by um, the broadcaster or trying to make a broadcast half hour or a broadcast one hour. Um, I mean, having done that myself, made broadcast um, one hours and having to have that input of so many people and having to have that input of the commissioning editor and people telling you how to finish a film and what to do, that kind of thing, that doesn't exist um, in short documentaries. You're kind of, in a sense, allowed to be free and tell stories that you are passionate about, which allows for some really incredibly fresh, authentic stories. And I think... Um, you know, and just looking tonight at Sophia's film, um, Close Ties, I mean, you, you, you kind of think, how did she get that incredibly intimate performance from those, um, from those characters in that film? And it is very much because they are her grandparents and, um, you know, she's gone in and she's chosen a family subject and something, you know, and she's really been very, um, I don't know, I think she's been really sensitive in the way that she's portrayed the story as well. So, you know, that for me... Encapsulate for people watching who haven't seen the film, I mean, people watching the stream, what the film's about. It's about... Yeah, so it's about... It's called Close Ties. It's about a couple that have been married for 45 years and um, it's about their wedding anniversary, their 45th wedding, wedding anniversary and all the normal things of, you know, shifting the furniture and just daily life interspersed with the fact that there is the secret, you know, that's kind of revealed subtly throughout the film that obviously um, Grandpa's been off for eight years with the other woman. I don't know if you noticed um, people who did see the film, Anna sitting at the table at the anniversary, <laughs> um, which was, I uh, thought, pretty pretty hilarious, really. Um, but, um, yeah, so it is a particularly poignant, and it is very much, I mean, we, we get a lot of, um, I think Poland has an incredibly, it's a Polish film, and Poland has an incredibly strong tradition of observational documentaries and very personal stories and we've had some quite remarkable films that have come through over the years but uh, I think in that respect it is um yeah a really beautiful personal story from Poland that stands up but such a you know we really are looking for that diversity and this you know from from Manus Island nowhere nowhere 
Lions Voices from Man- Manus Island, which was a beautiful film, all, all um, animated, but set to um, phone calls between a refugee and, and another, a person in Australia based on the Manus Island story to um, Let's Dance, David Bowie, Down Under, which was a film that we screened last year um, that was just incredibly um, popular by Ed Gibbs and Rebecca Shah, um, to particularly, it's a UK, um, Australian co-production. Um, we've had, you know, award-winning um directors like Lucy Walker, who of course is nominated for Academy Awards in her film, The Lion's Mouth Opens, which was in Flickerfest um, last year, and, and Three Stones for Jean Janae, directed by Patti Smith. So, and I think we also had a film produced by um, Steven Spielberg last year, and I was really pleased that we could uh, give him a bit of a, give him a bit of a run in Flickerfest. We thought maybe he might have needed some support in his filmmaking career. So it is an incredible range. But then, of course, we also have, you know, beautiful films like Narich, one of my favourite documentaries of all time that came through on a DVD with a little handwritten note um, from two filmmakers all the way from Elko Island. And they'd made this film, which was absolutely gorgeous and um, about a um, Corella that spoke Yongnyu and had an incredible position in the community. And once again, their access and they're living in this community, they were musicians. Um, and so this beautiful film came through that was such a surprise. So, you know, at Flickerfest, it's all in our short documentary competition and particularly in discovering Australian talent. It's really not about the budget. Uh, it's not about whether St- Steven Spielberg's connected. Um, it's not about the awards um, that the film has won elsewhere. It is all about those fresh new eyes on documentary and um, allowing these um, really compelling stories to shine through and perhaps discovering, um, you know, talented filmmakers like the filmmakers from Elko Island who had an incredible connection with the community up in Galawinku and, and just how they managed to represent this incredibly positive Indigenous story when we see so many negative stories about community and this was just such a beautiful story Um, and so that's really what we're looking for we're looking for that diversity we're looking to celebrate um, great short documentary stories um, with a range of styles and and themes and um, you know over the past 20 years we we've you know I think the festival in that sense goes from strength to strength so we're really happy to shine a light on short docs and give them a platform because they are so rare I mean we represent a number of films um, in an international broadcast um, sense of distribution, etc., selling films. But short docs are often the hardest place to find a home for. Um, but we do have some short docs within our catalogue, but uh, they are the hardest things to find a home for in a, in a outside of a festival platform. So we're really pleased to be able to celebrate them each year. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. There'll be an opportunity soon to ask one when questions. Um, we're actually going to have a Q&A like halfway through the... <laughs> The panel. Um, the next speaker, Joe, Joe <laughs> Chichester. Uh, Joe, um, the ABC doesn't screen many short docs, does it? I mean, we've got Australian Story, of course, but that's mm. something quite separate. But in terms of uh, where emerging filmmakers can get a break and actually have their films screened widely to, to a general public, um, that there is this opportunity now, isn't there, through iView to do that. Yeah. Do you want to talk to that? Yeah, I will. Uh, it's nice to be here. And by the way, I first met Tom when he was guest lecturer when I was at university in the oh. 80s and he was screening Friends and Enemies oh. <laughs> at Griffith <laughs> University. And I was studying documentary and so it's nice to be here on Tom's invitation. Um, so it is really difficult, as, as Bronwyn points out, because, you know, TV is divided into hours and half hours and some ideas just don't lend themselves to that. And also, it's a very hard thing if someone's an emerging filmmaker to find, uh, to, to, you know, give taxpayers money to a person who's not really tested out um, in longer format is a big risk with that money and it's a big pressure on that filmmaker. And so, you know, in television we talk all the time about, you know, digital interruption and uh, how, how difficult that is for us um, as people move away from... Um, appointment television but it's actually provided I think an enormous opportunity for emerging filmmakers because um, the digital space the online space uh, up till now although I think it it could be changing has really uh, lent itself to short form Um, the nature of viewing it and clicking means people aren't staying around for as long as they would uh, if they're sitting in front of a television and we've found that um, really liberating actually in, in TV arts because 
it's um, there's been a couple of ideas that have come to us in the past that we couldn't really quite see as an hour. We didn't really, they weren't really half hour. One of the first ones that came to us was a story, a series called Flashback Freetown. And I don't know if any of you saw that, but when it first came to the ABC, at that time, it was a story entirely based in Sierra Leone about the fashion industry there and about how people were using fashion in really kind of incredible ways. Um, and then we couldn't really use, uh, for various reasons to do with commissioning, we couldn't quite get that up as an hour or a half hour. And then a couple of years later, they came back to us and it ended up being an iView series that did enormously well. It was um, six times 12 minutes. And um, we found it a, a great opportunity to give those filmmakers um, a bit of a chance to kind of learn their craft. Um, uh, both of them went on to work within the ABC on uh, in the mix, so they're just making a magazine show at the moment, but they're constantly coming up with ideas that they're pitching. Uh, so we kind of looked at that uh, as a, a, a an experiment that worked really well. And with um, Screen Australia, with Liz, who's here from Screen Australia, um, uh, and Mandy Chang, who's the head of arts at ABC, came up with the idea to do uh, Art Bites. And I don't know if any of you have seen that, but it's... Um, it was an initiative that we came up with together that uh, I think at the time Screen, Screen Australia put in. Um, it was going to be, we're going to choose four film, uh, four ideas and each idea was going to get uh, $25,000 from Screen Australia and 25000 from us. And then they could go to their state body uh, and, and, and apply for money up to that amount as well. So they ended up with, you know, a fairly healthy budget to make uh, what was six by five minutes and this is one of our successful um, applicants and you'll see Brooks uh, film shortly but we ended up commissioning of course at the ABC we're always looking for a broad cross-section of types of ideas but also from across the country as our screen Australia so we came up with uh, we ended up with two from WA uh, and one from New South Wales and one from Queensland and they're all very very different uh, Ian, the WA one was Brooks one um, was focused on one artist, Ian Strange, and his practice and how it developed from one point in time. And he'd been documenting himself, actually, for quite a long time. Brooke will talk more about that. So that was a series that watched a filmmaker from place to place and it had kind of definite breaks in it between episodes. Uh, the Glass Bedroom was a wonderful series that uh, looked at how millennial-aged uh, people are using Instagram uh, in their arts practice and again choosing five very different art or six very different artists and how they were using Instagram just a beautiful little five I think that ended up some of them were a bit more longer than five minutes but just a very nice little story arc within that another one shock art which was about uh, very controversial or art you know to do with excrement and bodily parts and that kind of stuff uh, and another one called The Wanderers which was about graffiti art so that was that's been hugely successful for us I was just looking at my phone before so excuse me for being rude but I was just trying to find some figures on that and I couldn't find exact figures for those episodes but I did note that in the overall eye view figures for arts the month that they went up our kind of viewing went like that on the graph so it was like here and then it went like that so we had quite a lot of views and I'll try and get those numbers to you a bit later and that was really driven by a series that ended up sitting you know in in, in prime real estate on the iview carousel and it drove a lot of audience to arts content so we were really happy with that so with screen australia we're doing it again and we've gone to all the states and this time we've put a bit more into the pot so we've got thirty thousand for each project from screen australia from us and each of the states have committed to that amount and that just closed a couple of weeks ago and we're in the process of selecting the next four and uh, hopefully we'll we'll go again uh, if that's successful. So I think it's a great um, opportunity for filmmakers, particularly, and even, I mean, the other opportunity that we like is the, and is the half hour, which isn't a short film, but it's another kind of length that is really good for filmmakers to go from. What we'd love is to have a half hour series that filmmakers who've worked in that space of five to ten minutes can then kind of jump into that, that next... Uh, level, but uh, anyway, that's that's what we're doing in that space. In terms of factual, so that's just art stuff, but arts is pretty broad, arts and culture, um, and we've now kind of added some resources to that team. So we've got a supervising producer now in charge of our iView arts content, who's from Four Corners. 
So she was a you know a very well a very experienced producer from Four Corners who's come over to work in that space for us. And uh, Factual, our our friends over at Factual, you know, in the ABC world of little departments and really talk to each other, have obviously looked at what Arts is doing and thought that was a great idea. And they're also now going from doing great big three-hour series or uh, three times one-hour series or, or, or big docs like uh, the Bullied series, uh, they've now also engaged a supervising producer. And I think one of the first things I've seen that they did was Cyber Bullied with Tara Moss, which is, you know, they had that Bullied um, series with uh, Ian Thorpe, which was a big sort of hoo-ha about that show on the main channel but then they had an iview component which was again um just shorter form content that jumped use that as a jumping off place so i think it's a great opportunity uh for us and really, for filmmakers has it already been made that, that one? cyber bully yeah. cyber bullies yeah it's, on, it's, it's on. on iview at the cool. moment and it's again i think it's um it's six ten, yeah. ten minutes it's on, it's on. Yeah, but minutes, but yeah. factual will be moving into that space. Um, so it's really worth keeping an eye on it because if you're a factual documentary producer um, or director, um, it's it's somewhere that you might want to start thinking about pitching your content if what you're just that starting. What's Housemates? Do you, did you see that? There's a series called Housemates, which I think, I don't know if whether, whether, that, was, whether that came through factual or or entertainment, but it was it was a, a series of, of short um, pieces about people sh who share houses and, and uh, the first episode was an absolute cracker and mm. I think they did a series I think they're, they're, they're doing another series of that um, I think that did very well I think I think, it was fa I think that was factual mm. too yeah. oh, and the other side of that coin is you mentioned Let's Dance and I'm really glad mm. that that ended up getting a screening with Flickerfest I mean they came to us as well and you know there's a bit of argy-bargy and they had a kind of a perfectly formed 15 minutes and we were like well if we're going to put money into it what are we going to do with it it needs to be an hour for us and is there an hour in that story where well, there could be that but then you you have to sometimes an idea is just pure and and good as it mm. is at 15 minutes or 18 minutes or or whatever so um so yeah again a, a great idea this these people had some incredible access and they got this lovely film that screened on uh, at Flickerfest and no doubt doing circuits uh, traveling mm. around and, and they've just released another they've just worked on another short like a companion piece to their feature which is another thing that yeah. short dockers can be a companion piece to a mm. A larger oh, piece, so was... yeah, and that was about David Bowie in Australia yeah. and the Let's Dance um, video clip that was made mm. here. Mm. 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 Short docs sometimes can grow into features, mm. which is actually yeah. uh, what Charlie Phillips will be talking about later from the Guardian. Uh, I'm just thinking, um, let's move on. Maybe show a one one of episode from under the series, and uh, we've got Brooke here. Actually, I was thinking, Brooke, maybe you could just do it, do the intro before we. I was supposed to do that book. But you do, I know, I know. But, but I, th I think, <laughs> but we, I think we can do Brooke. And I was actually yeah. going to ask Brooke, what, what drew you to the short form initially? Uh, the opportunity that ABC and Screen Australia and Screen West provided us. Uh, we yeah. had started off with a feature idea and uh, we were speaking to the ABC uh, about that. And um, through the chats that we were having with the ABC, we... Um, we um, well, we found out about the initiative and we thought, well, let's try and put our feature idea into the short form. But then part of our, part of looking at the application and the budget that we had meant that we had to totally rethink the idea. So you had a feature idea originally? We had a feature idea originally, right, okay. which we um, put down to create something entirely different when we knew about the opportunity okay, and what the opportunity okay. was looking that's, for. That's and so we, we, we recast. Um, and then the feature idea is is still being made, and now it has um, uh, more substance to it because it's it, mm. it's had the, um, the the short doc behind it. Well, or should we just screen the short doc now, so that when we talk later, people have seen it and that make a bit more sense.
I've always been fascinated by the home. I think it's something that sits in everyone's imagination. It's this powerful symbol that we take with us. The act of painting on a house or crossing a house out or painting a black mark on it reveals the home to be this incredibly vulnerable object. It represents all these ideas of stability, family, community, the economy, all built into something that's this very small piece of architecture, but in reality it's so unstable. I mean, there's many aspects to him as an artist, you know, he's a hard artist to actually identify as such. I'm a visual artist, in part a filmmaker. I like making films, but I don't make narrative films. I like making photography. I create interventions in real life, but then document them and then exhibit the documentation. But I'm also really interested in the stories that sit behind there. So when I, when I talk about a suburban intervention, it's when I go out and I literally intervene. So I, I put myself into the world and change it. There's a surrealness to them, and you, you're not convinced they're real until you delve into the, his working methods. So that's what I'm really interested in doing, showing reality askew and, and pushing and pulling with these sort of familiar images and icons in the world. A lot of those sort of uh, ephemeral art forms, it's there and then it's gone. Documentation is a really important part of that process. I think when you see a home, you see it through the lens of film anyway. That's something I'm trying to access, is that familiar sense of the home in people. I don't want them to react to that. I think his work is reflecting on the uh, demise of the American dream in a lot of ways. I think there's, there's a great commentary on what's happening in our country. The house is really an important symbol. You know, we, we all can relate to a home and we all have different impressions of our home. I didn't really start to think about home in my work until I left Australia. Ian was, was well known as a street artist, particularly work from the late 1990s, operating under the moniker of KidZoom. And when he went first to the US, it was a mentorship he did with Ron English. He was interesting because he had like an, an amazing skill set, and he was super obsessed about spray paint. Anybody that has done graffiti, I think, understands how, how good Ian is, you know, because it's a very, very difficult medium. I think it was, before Ian, it was kind of unthought of to do something that photorealistic with the spray can. You know, hanging next to Banksy and Swoon and, and all the kind of iconic figures of that movement, Ian became very famous as Kid Zoom. And I think that he felt like that was a persona that didn't fit what he wanted to ultimately be. Like, street art and graffiti has a very gritty urban context, and for me, someone who grew up in the suburbs, I didn't necessarily feel like that was my environment or the context to make work in. Street art, graffiti, painting with aerosol, that was just one thing I was interested in doing, so I wanted to find a way of taking the photography, my film background, all those things that I was excited about and turning them into one thing and trying to work out what kind of artist I wanted to be. I grew up in Perth, I tried to escape for so long and I finally end up in New York. And then the first thing I want to do is make work about the place I came from. Thank you.
wanted to ask you, I mean, where do, where do we go with the other? The, was this the first episode in, in that yes. in the series? Yes, yeah, okay, that's so the first episode. Do you want to just summarise roughly wh where you take, take the story? Uh, so the story goes through uh, Ian's exhibitions from 2011 through to uh, th uh, 2015. And so the first episode was sort of an overview. It gives you an idea about what the series is going to go into and look at. And the second episode looks at Suburban, which was a exhibition that he did in... Uh, sorry, the second exhibition looks at Home, which was the... The, the final image that you saw there of the the constructed home with the, the skull on it. And so that was at Cockatoo Island in Sydney, here. Um, so that was the, the second episode. The third episode looked at Suburban, which was an exhibition he did in uh, America, looking at... Um, that was informed by the global financial crisis at the time that he was over there. The fourth episode looks at... Uh, uh, third, third, third was Suburban, fourth is Final Act, which is looking at an exhibition that he did at Christ, in Christchurch in New Zealand, looking at homes that had been or were about to be destroyed as part of the Christchurch earthquake. It's a really beautiful uh, episode of letting go, I think, for the people who were involved in losing their homes. Um, and then uh, episode five is on shadow and landed and so landed is the is the house that you saw that was embedded in the ground painted black and shadow looks at a exhibition that he did which was painting the painting houses black and taking photographs of them during the day and so they looked like they were in shadow but when you actually drill down into what's going on in the, the image you realize that it's daytime, so how are they in shadow? And um, that was all done in Perth, in Western Australia, using homes that were um, slated for demol uh, de demolition. And then the final episode looks at what Ian is, what, what, what was next for him. And it goes back to New York and his journey, um, or, or what he saw as being the, the future. And that goes back to the feature idea, which looks at, um, looking at holdout houses around the world. So he um, is interested in, in why people might be attached to their home despite extreme circumstances. And that's what the feature idea was and that's what we were originally looking at but we realised for the, the funding that we had that we couldn't achieve that enormous work with that, that amount of money but we could do a really beautiful look at what Ian had, had developed. So, you're speaking back. I mean, when did you finish that, that work? Roughly? So that was finished in February this year. February, right. So what what response did you get from you know, the audience that would have seen it in live view? And I mean, how how do you see the what you did now? What what did you learn from that experience? Uh, in terms of response, um, I know that we had. Uh, Am I able to tell figures? I don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know that in the first week. We're not Foxtel. We're okay. Not. Um, <laughs> I know that in the the first week that it came out, we had uh, ten thousand views. One of the things that I found really interesting about it was that um, so there is there's uh, six episodes. One of the things that I found really interesting is that uh, half of that ten thousand watched just the first episode, and then it dropped down after that sort of. Um, on a gradient so it, you really have to when you're making short form or series short form try and work out a way to um, make sure you've got a, a hook to get people to come back each time uh, so that that was an interesting thing that we, we've learned. That's also a problem for us too that we're trying to fix at the moment which is about the player not you know those of you who have Netflix yeah. don't have this problem so we're fixing the player so that it does automatically tell you that there's another film coming but it's just been a bit of a cumbersome problem for us, which, mm. and you know, this was proof because these were all a series. It happened with all of them, so it was proof that we needed to get that player fixed pretty fast. So that's yeah. what we're working yeah. on. Yeah. 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 But yeah, but you're right. Like, if you're doing a series, you do want to have a some method of telling people that something's coming next. That there's 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 more to come. 
And, and we tried really hard to, well, well Ian and, and Dominic Pierce, who, who were the editors on this, tried really hard to sort of give a little bit of a, a flavour at the end of each of the episodes of what was next, which is why you saw Home in, at, at the last um, image of the first one, which, which is the next episode and so forth. But um, mm. sometimes that's not possible because the, the episode is necessarily discreet mm. and, and that was um, what we found in, in certainly Final Act. Mm. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, maybe just to, um, talking more generally, more broadly about you as a filmmaker, as an emerging filmmaker, I mean, how do you see this as sitting within what you see as something that you want to do next? Um, yeah, maybe well, to talk I, about that. I mean, do you want to stay in documentary? Do you want to stay making these series? Or do you want to move, move forward? Or how do you want to take it? Uh, I, I have um, an interesting history. I actually started off out in the um, art department of the feature film industry. And so I had a heap of onset experience and then retrained as a lawyer. And while I was retraining as a lawyer, I got asked to produce a feature doc, which was a 12 year in the making observational documentary about musicians trying to make it in the world. And so that was an epic uh, undertaking. Um, and that was called Mule Tickets and it had its premiere at the Melbourne International Film Festival last year, which was pretty exciting. Um, uh, and so then I have come out of law and into filmmaking as a producer. And for me, I really enjoy making documentaries because of the personal relationships that you generally get with the subjects that you're filming. I, I really enjoy having smaller crews and um, having quite an intimate sort of shoot, but, um, and, but also production um, and uh, ha see myself doing that going forward. But uh, with the initiative that I have recently been given with Screen Australia, I am we're looking at scripted also. Um, I'm looking at developing scripted also. What I have found with the initiatives that ABC has provided me, there was two. One, one that hasn't been mentioned tonight is um, there was an initiative, an initiative that Mandy Chang and Ryan Hodson at Screen West organised, which was called Arts X West, mm, yeah. and that gave four West Australian artists the opportunity to make a five-minute doco on a, a, a on an artist, and we did a, a little five-minute one on the artist Abdul Abdullah. Um, and so that was we, we were given the opportunity because there was this that was the uh, precursor really yeah, to Art Bites yeah, yeah. This, th this initiative came up and we were given that opportunity which opened up Art, Arts Bites because it worked mm. um, and uh, the short little doco that we did on Abdul Abdullah is still playing and I love that it's still up there on ABC mm. it's great and in the current <laughs> round of uh, Art Bites applications his name appears in about <laughs> <laughs> quite a lot of them yeah he's doing pretty well yeah um, and so um, that was uh, producing that short five minute one gave me a flavor of, of what it would be like to produce a six by five minute one. Um, uh, and then from that, uh, yeah, like I do hope um, that I'll, I'll sort of be able to move more to the half an hour and, and what have you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I do have the feature experience for working on, yeah. for five yeah. years on, on um, uh, yeah, a documentary filmed over yeah. 20 years, but yeah. yeah. And if <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. You do. <laughs> but it, it's only, I mean, you know, everything in small stages and you do, yeah. uh, for me, I have found it a really beautiful thing that, you know, we did a five minute one for a certain budget and then a, a six by five minute one for a bigger budget. And then the next one that I'll do will be something bigger for a bigger budget and it's incrementally learning all of the time. And I guess dealing with broadcasters and you know yeah. commissioning editors and that process and the business side of it with Screen Australia and the state bodies, it's a good experience to learn all those relationships as well. And also little things like um, business structure, like how you're actually going to run um, the company that you run things through and how you're going to work out your insurance and all of that sort of stuff. It's kind of, it's really useful to, to work that sort of stuff out on a, on a very little thing rather yeah. than on a huge, yeah, sure. <laughs> huge thing. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this could be a good chance to just um, maybe have a pause <coughs> before our other two speakers and throw it open to the audience. On, online, but also here in this room, just for some questions. I mean, just for it's about ten minutes before we get back to the panel. Um, anybody who would like to 
put up their hand for a question. Go to the mic. Oh, yes, if they could go to the mic, preferably. Okay. Person okay. over there. Yeah. Thanks. Um, hello, thank you for that. Um, uh, one of the biggest things um, um, I would like to ask about is, uh, for those of you who have both worked in documentary films and also short films or feature films, what are some of the um, biggest things you would have to prepare for yourself, the differences of how to, say, direct a, um, an actor who would who's sticking to a script and um, continue uh, acting to a story and a and directing a uh, a real life person in a documentary who who's going about their daily business and showing the things what they like and what are the what are what are what are the best and probably like uh, biggest ways to um to get um to to interact and get the the what you want out of them. I'll just jump in and say, um, in lots of ways they're actually the same thing and a lot of people who work in documentary um, don't realise this until you, you know, that if you make a feature, a film that is a drama, you write a script and you, you write a pre-shoot script and you block it out, you, you work out what shots you need to get, what coverage you need, that's how you do a feature film or a drama. It's the same for documentary that you, you know, you do have to think about uh, even if it's an ob dog, you you do have to know the story well enough or where it might go to kind of plan every day, do a pre-shoot script in in your imagination. How do I want this to pan out over this five minutes or ten minutes or half an hour? And you do write a pre-shoot script just like you would a drama. Now the people might behave differently um, because it's a documentary. So, but it gives you as a director an idea of what you need to get, what scenes you need to get. It gives you an idea of. If, if you're going to uh, follow someone who's going to go and brush their teeth and then they're going to go and get in the car and they're going to go to the shops, whatever they're going to do, by plotting it out in a pre-shoot script, you work out what coverage you need to get when you're filming. It's not, just an, it's not enough in a documentary to follow somebody. You also have to get, and sometimes you do have to go back and get it, like, you know, you do have to get a setting up shop of, a shot of the stairwell they're about to walk down and then you get, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's the only thing I would say about it is that ba they both require that level of pre-shoot and preparation. Yeah. I'd add to it that um, in in the you know small experience that I've had, the first time that we've been working with the subject, we haven't had a camera. So we've just gone in, we've um, sort of worked out the space. It's generally in people's homes or a, a space that they are working in or what have you, and we've just said hi. And so you get to know the person and you get to get a sense of their story and then um, then, then go away and write the questions and make sure that your questions are open-ended. But there is a real structure to the way that you're preparing your questions and the way that you're asking them because you know way before you're, you've got a camera in front of someone what you need them to say. You um, need to know the answer before you ask yeah, the question. Yeah, you need to know the answer before, yeah. Before and they probably need to trust you as well and that's a really important thing I think with documentaries and particularly making observational documentaries and like films like Close Ties obviously they were grandparents that made it a bit easier but having that trust and allowing characters to trust you as a filmmaker takes that you know it's really important to have that period of research and pre-production in a documentary so people get to know you so when you turn up with the camera it's not like oh wow you're here with the camera and I'm going to behave differently now or I'm uncomfortable with this camera they need to feel like the camera's an extension of you so that pre-production time that you'd put into writing a script for a drama or a short film you need to put as much time into that preparation for a documentary and developing that trust with the characters Does, yeah, um... I, just, I, I would just add to that that I think one of the most powerful things in, um, in documentary uh, is observing change over time so, and that that that's a process of building building story and being if you if you if you have if you can take the time, um, if if your if your subject lends it. I mean, you know, you, you've worked with Ian Strange over over many years to sort of record it. Yeah, you know, so you can sort of see over time. You see the development of an artist. Will, will similarly with with, with documentary. Um, I think there's a, there's a real power in in being able to see a story unfold over over a, an extended period of time. I mean, you don't always have that luxury, but in terms of uh, of interviewing someone, I've always found that 
it's really great if you if you want to do a, a if you have a, a, a central character and you, you you're going to perhaps use an interview with them as the story bed then you probably want to have three stabs at that interview so you might interview them at the beginning uh, of the process then you might interview them halfway through and then you would you would interview them again at the end and those interviews are just absolutely crucial and you need to take a lot of time over them you can't rush them you have to really kind of build an environment that supports the person that you're interviewing and create a really safe space for them so you can't you can't just sort of rush in there with a crew and set up and expect it to all happen you really need to to give it a lot of time yeah Thank you. Thanks very much for the panel. Yeah. Really good response. I mean, personally, I, I often, when I do the interview, I sort of do a bit of warm up, and then the leading questions I, I tend to ask at the end, and maybe that I then go back to the start <laughs> and get and re ask the same questions I asked at the very beginning. But anyway, there's also some different interview techniques. Anybody else at this point? I can't see any at the moment. I think we could just keep going if you like, and just. Why are you short to come along? <laughs> Mark. I might be about to address that actually. For us, for Flickrfest, it's thirty minutes. That's you know thirty to thirty-five is probably the maximum of what we'd screen as a short documentary in competition, and that's relatively standard across the world in short film. Competition. Well, the Oscars talk yeah. about shorts being like an hour long, aren't they? Yeah. They do, but there's not. Yeah, but there's not many short film festivals that will screen shorts up to maximum would be forty five. For yeah, us, right. it's thirty five. That's yeah. kind of like when it when it starts to get, it's not not short anymore. <laughs> it's an hour. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the yeah. other liberating thing about um, the digital disruption to television, is that you know I, I hope we get to a point where we do away with the idea of an hour or half an hour because mm. there's so many films that we get that um, we've commissioned half an hour and they've delivered they've asked us to come to the screening and it's an hour and then we have a big fight <laughs> and um, and oftentimes you kind of think you know what it's probably a perfect 42 minute film but no, yeah. yeah so mm. I look forward to and some of the research that we're getting in is indicating that yeah, we're always thinking, oh, one minute, five minutes, you know, three minutes, people's attention span is so short. But in fact, online viewing is becoming longer and longer. So we measure how long people are watching, mm. not just click on. And people are actually watching for longer. So I think you'll see more of that kind of content where this idea of short and long changes. Good. Um, I think we should keep going. Okay. At this point, Jessica, do you mind? Yeah, sure, um, sure, yeah. Maybe you can talk to some of the things that, that have been raised so far. Maybe also talk about your brief or your slate at the moment. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so Compass. Uh, for those of you who still watch linear television, you might know it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's an ABC series that's been going for a long time since the the mid eighties, um, and uh, it it explores um, belief, ethics, values the search for meaning um, in, in all its many forms. So we're, we're a kind of recognisable brand, but what we, what we have is an enormous kind of diversity of content. So when you, when you and one of, our, one of our actual dilemmas is that people, when people switch on campus, they don't necessarily know what they're going to get. Um, but that's, that's also a great gift because it gives us the opportunity to, to, to screen very, to, to both to, to make and to, to, to curate very, very diverse content. So as I said earlier, we, we, we have a season that runs for 37 uh, weeks in the year. Um, and of those 13 uh, episodes, uh, and they are half hour episodes, 13 are acquisitions. And I've been trying in my tenure there, which has been, I'm in my fourth year there now, I've been trying really hard to work as much as possible with with local um, producers and filmmakers, and it's actually it's actually quite challenging uh, to find programs that fit the half hour slot that is our is our remit. Um, so w we have had a number of permutations that of, of making content for Compass that that operate within a, a very kind of if, if you like quite a sort of um, Rigid structure, really, because we are, we are, we have an ironclad 27 minute 30 program that goes to air. Our time slots change from 6:30 on Sunday to six o'clock on on Saturday um, this year, and 
Um, I've worked with filmmakers in a whole bunch of different ways. I mean, Mark Gould is here tonight. We, we, we've made a, we've made three three really lovely programs over over the time I've been there um, that explored various different um, uh, faiths and and rituals of uh, of in in in, in uh, different countries. Um, but I've I've worked with uh, filmmakers who haven't had nearly as much experience as, as Mark. Where two two examples last year. Um, Somebody came to us with a with a, a short program that was made for a um, uh, a corporate uh, for, for white ribbon actually, which was about a woman who was uh, doing an ultra marathon run through rural New South Wales to to um, uh, attract attention to domestic violence in rural areas, and that was running. I think I think it was uh, it was about twenty minutes, and so we had to actually add on content in order to bring it up to. Um, the 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 right the, requ the required length and that was a really great experience working with with um, Steve Pazwalski who had made the original program to get that up to up to the right length for us and I've just been working with another filmmaker who called Tony Houston who's been um, based down in um, on the on the south coast an episode that actually went to air on on Saturday uh, this last week called Being Change now that was a feature documentary that she cut down to us for us. Um, to, to a half hour, um, which which worked really brilliantly and and, and got a, got some really really great um, audience uh, audience uh, reactions on on social media and things, so that's just two examples of the sorts of ways that we can work. And each year we will do uh, two or three of those. Um, now where where the where the rub sets in is that um, we don't have a lot of money. What we do have, and, and I think this is a, this this is not to be underestimated for for filmmakers, is is we do have, um, uh, you know, we, we, you get, you get a broadcast. So so the deal is, if you have a license agreement with us, you that the film is screened. Um, uh, I think it's uh, five times over a three year license period, and it's it's run on iView, um, on catch up for a month. Um, and you know we get we get pretty good audiences, um, and it's also uh, a pathway to market for for you guys if you if you have an idea that that fits our remit, where you can actually I'm, I'm working with uh, with um, several filmmakers at the moment. Judy Mensel's here this evening. I'm working with Judy on a film. Um, I'm working with uh, Katya Nizic and Britt Arthur in uh, on a, a really lovely half hour about Anne Deverson where you know they basically they showed me the teaser. I thought it was really great. Um, and they've they've now you know I gave them a letter of interest and they were able to then go and sort of st start to sort of stitch together a deal to to complete the post production of that film. Now we used to have quite a lot of money to do co-pros, but that was all taken away from us a few years ago and fed back into the the main prime time budget. So when I say we don't have much money, I mean we don't have much money. So often people you know and I'm talking like four figures you know for an acquisition fee. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how much, otherwise I'll get into trouble. But um, it's not a lot of money. But I think, and, and you know, and there's part of me that feels, you know, as, as having been on your side of the fence, there's part of me as, as the series producer that feels like it's, you know, it's a pretty raw deal not be, not to be able to offer filmmakers more. Um, but it but it is it is an opportunity to to, and they're often they're often what I would describe as passion projects. You know, they're 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 programs that people are really really passionately want to communicate to a broader audience. Um, and it's, I, I find it, I mean, I, I don't often work very closely in an editor, editorial way with the, with the filmmakers, but, but when I do, I found it a really, really satisfying experience. And I think I, I, I would hope that they would, they would agree with me. So, so it's a, it's a, you know, it's a collaborative process. That's, um, that's a very, very, uh, enjoyable one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So but people ha have some questions of, uh, of Jessica in relation to campus. Uh. Jessica, I just want to ask, do you yeah. pre... Do you commission or do no, you just we can't. buy? No, oh, no. So, sorry. so we're usually, you know, we will be last in. You know, we have such a, such a such a weenie amount of money to offer Brom, and it's um, that that uh, you know, and, we, and nor you know, we used to be able to. We, we, we stitched to, when Rose Hesp was still the executive producer of Compass, and when I was working there with Rose. We stitched together this deal that was called um, an enhanced acquisition, where we could actually bring some. Um, facilities to the table well we can't even do that now you know that's just simply not 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 possible because of the uh, um, 
the, the call on the ABC's post-production facilities. So what's happened, as you would all know, you know, over the last over the last sort of few years, there's been a really, really kind of savage um, budget cuts. So, and I think you know we've all worn those in in, in different ways. Um, but look, you know, still really, really working hard to to to, uh, to maintain a relationship with with local local filmmakers and and to work with them to produce really great great content. Yeah. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah. <laughs> it's very tough. Very difficult. And well, as you say, passion that, projects. That's, that's, the, that's the situation for that program in mm. terms of budget. So other parts yep. of the ABC. Do uh, yep. commission uh, progr progr projects, um, and there are you know set fees uh, for half hours and for one hours, you know, and then yeah, for pre sales yeah. it's completely different, yeah, yeah. different sort of you know where 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 there, where there are larger chunks of money that are invested in into a program at the beginning, you know. Yeah, and there's you know producer offset and pep and all that kind of stuff that so mm. yeah, other departments and other programs do still uh, commission. But you can also access PEP if, if, if you're clever about how you how you stitch up the deal with us. You can also hopefully access um, the uh, the PEP money from screen agencies. And the other thing um, is, you know, when you bring a project to the ABC, um, we have editorial control over it, and it has to be like that. You know, so you, you're working, you're having a program that's being aired on the public broadcaster, and we have a duty to um, abide by all kinds of editorial policies, of course, but also. You know, presumably we're in positions because we have an idea about what works for audiences, and there's a lot of tension in that process in some cases, no tension at all in others. Uh, I know that with the art bites, I don't know that the story for you guys, I think it, but some of the others require a lot of work, um, a lot of cuts, a lot we, of work. We, we did, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to get it to get it right, which is great, which is exactly how um, the sector should be, you know, using. Um, the broadcaster mm, mm. so it's just it's not like you can you know with I don't know with film festivals you know people come with a finished product or do they come with a product that's close uh, to finished do you have editorial input sometimes we do very weirdly and uh, I never expected that we would uh, but sometimes we do for example with Narich they came to us with a 30 minute film and we actually said oh I actually said to them, I really love this film, but it's just a little bit too long. And we actually worked with them to help to cut it down to a 17-minute film, which then we went on to help them sell to NITV. So um, in some instances, we do give advice, or I will look at things that are a little bit long for us and say, well, if you could just get it down to 30 mm. minutes, we'll take it. Or if you could just, you know, make that, you know. That's not the usual, though. Most people do complete their films. <laughs> the, the rough cut, we're not advising, um, although I'd like to at times. Uh. Is that what you do, David, sometimes? <laughs> I'm keeping separation completely from giving advice on films. Um, <laughs> do, do you want to talk a, a little bit about Antenna, possibly, because we, and we, it'd be lovely to show the film, too. Yes, um, so I'll, I'll be short. Um, should we see the film first? Let, let's... let's I want to give a. You want to give just a bit of an yes, intro? Okay, and fine. Finish with this. Um, so, as you said earlier, um, the festival uh, is the only dedicated festival in Sydney for documentaries. It has been established in 2011, so this year is our seventh year. Uh, we're showcasing um, documentaries with a strong emphasis on a feature length creative cinematic documentaries. So every October we screen about 35 feature films uh, from around the world and we have three competitions including um, Australian short competition with a cash prize as well. Uh, the way we see the role of the festival is that we are here to, um, to develop audiences for documentary films. However, Antenna is not only an audience festival, there is also an industry component. We have the, we have the Doc Talk program, we have master classes and workshops uh, we're inviting international guests, um, from uh, high-profile international guests and local guests from the industry. So the festival provides great networking opportunities for emerging filmmakers. And um, many of the people that will watch your films at the festival will be, will be uh, able to buy or acquire or um, fund your next project. A few examples. Uh, was, for example, one of uh, the films that screened a couple of years ago. It was a student film from uh, Sydney Film School um, called The Eden Gem. On the jury was um, Penny Smolokov, now the head of um, 
Indigenous department at Screen Australia. Back then she was a commissioning editor at NITV. Uh, she was on the jury, she saw the film, she loved it, and she acquired it to be broadcast on television. Uh, also, when I look at the program in the past six years, I can see um, short films by filmmakers and directors that uh, went on to produce successful Australian films. Film filmmakers such as Maya Newell, uh, Holly Pfeiffer, Kitty Green, David Fidel, and so on. So those good examples of uh, what I think Antenna can give uh, US filmmakers uh, and do for your film. In terms of the selection process, uh, we from last year we have a dedicated uh, short programmer, Margaret McHugh. Uh, she sourced the film, she watched uh, the, all the submission film and she sourced from different uh, from film schools and from different relationships with other programmers in Australia. And then we, um, she created for us a short list. We all watching the films and we are meeting for a final uh, three of us, me, my colleague Rich and Margaret to, uh, to select together the final uh, program. Um, so what type of film we are looking for? So in terms of eligibility, um, all films, all Australian films, under 30 minutes are eligible, uh, as long as they were produced after the 1st of January 2016. Uh, we only accept Australian shorts and we do not require any uh, uh, premiere status. Uh, we don't mind if your film shows anywhere else in, in, in the short section, uh, because we see the role mainly as to provide access and to provide to support young filmmakers. So that's our main um, objective here. Um, I think it's important to mention that this submission is now open. We actually left, um, we extended the deadline to, uh, to Friday because I knew that they're going to speak here. <laughs> so please submit your films. Um, in terms of what we're looking for, so uh, we don't have a preference of subject matter or style, of course, we're very open. Uh, we think everything can be interesting. It's dependent on the vision of the filmmaker. Um, like feature, we want to see films that, uh, that have a unique point of view, that's telling us something new, the, that uh, there is an artistic vision behind, behind uh, that we can see a director behind. Um, we select films that utilize the short medium um, smartly, uh, not simply short version of what could have been a scene from a long feature film. Uh, we see it very different form. As feature films, you have time to develop your character, your story. Um, in a short form, you have to capture smaller, smaller ideas um, in a more sophisticated way, I guess. Uh, we also open for experimental and for more art-based films. Um, but it's also, I guess, important to mention, I guess, uh, what Bronwyn was saying is that we also, it's very important for us to create a program as a whole. So we do look at the artistic merit of the film, but it's also important for us to look at how it sits, sits with the, the overall program, uh, whether it screens before the feature, so we're trying to match the thematic or whether it's screened as part of a full program, so we're trying to curate it so audiences can enjoy the, the full program. Um, now, instead of trying to articulate what good films are, I want to show you a good film. So, yep. uh, this was a film uh, called Ghost Train by Kelly Hackel and James Fleming. Uh, it won the best Australian film, Australian short film, uh, a couple of years ago. And, uh, and um, thank you. Look, it's probably a good time to just pause briefly. I would, I do want to show a, a clip um, of, the, of Charlie Phillips about Guardian documentaries. But just in the interim, are there any questions or any tweets that are coming in? One question there. Sorry, you've been hanging around for a while. Sorry, no, <laughs> I noticed okay. you earlier. No, I got the timing wrong. Um, uh, hello, thank you so much for coming and showing you those two lovely things. Um, I guess just for someone my age who's like a recent graduate, uh, I guess there's 
quite a paralyzing fear of doing something that's cliched. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you um, could talk about uh, what, what, what you see that, that, that makes a, a film stand out. I mean, because I guess something like Compass, which, you know, my family's watched my whole life, uh, I guess it's been going since the 80s. At some point, you're going to retread ground, at least in some way. But, but, but what is the X factor that, that, that makes a story stand out for you and makes it unique? Oh, that's a really interesting question because um, I mean, it's, each film, of course, is different. But um, I think I think uh, authenticity is something that you know where where you, where you really want to uh, like the film that was on 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 Saturday, which was a really really quite a, a, a called Being Change, which was about one woman's impact on a very small part of southern New South Wales. Um, and uh, there was obviously a really, I mean, she's, a, she's somebody who's been um, provided a sanctuary for, for people and for animals and has dedicated her life to that. And there was obviously a really, a really very strong uh, relationship between her and the filmmaker, um, and to the extent that the filmmaker had made a feature, feature length documentary about her. Um, so that had a wonderful authenticity. But then I'm thinking about, you know, there was another film entirely different made by. Um, Karanda say it called uh, by Compass and Quran, which was the story of the um, Afghan Camelias, which we screened a couple of years ago, um, and that was a really very complex um, mixture of archive and interview with some of the surviving descendants of the Camelias, and it was a really really complicated film to make had a lot of elements, and it, again that was a cut down from a from a one hour doc. Um, but it had this, you know, the interviews with the, with the descendants, the families were, were really just magic. And they, the, the sort of interweaving of the elements was just really, really very fine, finely done, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, the X factor. It's, um, I think the authenticity, I would just say don't overthink it. Don't get, yeah. too, don't, don't get too caught up in, I know exactly where you're at, you know, don't... De- too caught up in it's all been done it's all been said and I st- you know forget about all of that forget everything you, if you look at those short films they're obviously films if you're thinking of drama that were very close to those filmmakers there was a story there that um, those filmmakers felt connected to and they just went with it so I would just think follow your heart you know whether it's a documentary or drama whatever it is you want to do what's something that just interests you someone might tell you a story a funny stupid thing that happened to them and you just find it endlessly amusing well there's your short film hmm. i mean we, we get at flicker fest this year we had almost two and a half thousand entries and we whittled that down to around um well we had 110 films in competition so that's massive months and months and months of viewing and I always get asked what makes a good short film or how do you make those decisions you know knowing that you know you've got to leave some people out of that equation um, but it is very much as um, both Jessica and Joe have said about authenticity you can really still tell the stories that people are passionate about um, and they really do um, feel in, you know incredibly authentic and real and they give you an insight into that because they're very personal you can tell it's a personal story that someone's really you know to make a short film you've got to be really passionate about it um, otherwise um, it definitely you know I think um, won't make it through to the big screen or the small screen I think it's that passion and that drive because you know you're often unfunded you've got to do it um, you know with the support of you know uh, getting people to support you and you know really putting a lot of effort in and it's not really a commercial concern so it is really about that having that authentic story and making something that you care about that you get it that's going to hang around for a long time I mean we've got short films like I think Rachel Griffith's short film Tulip from 1993 um, that we still represent in our catalogue people are still buying that film um, David Michaud who made Animal Kingdom his short films have been you know in his life for a long time and still you know are on were on his DVD before the feature in France etc so you know I mean I think being an authentic filmmaker is working out what you want to say um, and, and <laughs> being you know <laughs> and sticking Although to that. At AIDC uh, I was pitched a film about um, someone's passion project and it was um it was very seriously for me to follow this journey of this pan pipe player <laughs> who was on a mission to gather all the pan pipe players from around the world for one. And I seriously thought I was being in some candid camera thing or being 
punked up and I was trying to take it. Anyway, so it's not just passion. You no. also, I mean, if you're going to, if you want to make There's a some film. Some skill involved. You, you might want to also think about, you might want to also think about what is the audience for your film. So when I say don't overthink it, don't overthink about the cliches and things like that. Think about what's important to you and then think about well, how, would this be interesting to an audience as well? So certainly if you're working with a broadcaster, you need to think about that. Do you think they were trying to be too clever with the panpipe thing? Too cool or no? It's just one of those. <laughs> it's one of those magical moments at AIDC. I was just <laughs> going to say that, that, that quite often um, good ideas, um, you know, for 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 first films of whether they're drama or documentary, is, is something quite quite local and quite small and quite mm. personal to you. You know, mm. I think often are the stories that that are, are a good place to begin. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Do, do you mind if I ask one more question? One more question? No. No. Okay. Waste time. Is that okay? Just, sure. just for the uh, directors here, um, especially you. Um, uh, I was very interested to hear some of the advice that you gave earlier about um, how how much control and influence as a director you really do have in a documentary. I guess as as just someone who's been a fan of documentary filmmaking up till now, um, up till recently, uh, I've always kind of assumed that it was a very light touch. Um, but I, but I suppose that's not really the case. But could you go into a bit more detail about like w where is the place to to step in and and to sculpt, and where perhaps you should step away and 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 let something unfold by itself? Um, so I I am one of three producers that produced yeah. the um, yeah. home e of um, home the art of Ian Strange. So Jetta Andrews was a producer who worked with um, Ian alongside his art career. And Amanda Morrison, who I also worked with, she is an executive producer um, and who took a producer role in, in developing this. Uh, Ian directed himself on this um, and he, he had a huge amount of help from uh, the editor, Dominic Pierce, in terms of the, how we were managing the archive material and uh, the interviews. Uh, the interviews that we did use was a, a conversation between Ian and I in terms of how many we would do for the money that we had and how we would also do them. Um, in terms of my role as a producer in um, sculpting what a director does, uh, it ranges from every different project and it uh, uh, is different in every single project. Some projects you take a, a more... I call it administrative role where you really are just sort of running the contracts and what have you and other times you take a really immersive creative role and you sort of get in there and, and um, are, are assisting as much as possible and being a second pair of eyes and a shit tester for want of a better word. Um, so sometimes if something's not working, you're the first person to, to be able to see that and, and be able to help. Um, it's a really fine line because sometimes people get really annoyed um, with you being a creative producer. Uh, so you've got to manage it uh, differently with each director to make sure that you are helping them create the best that they possibly can. One, one thing I would say about documentary generally um, is that you cannot underestimate the role of the editor. Mm. Mm. Um, it's it's a it's a really you know it's a very mercurial um, and wonderful thing when it works, and it's a complete nightmare when it doesn't. But when it works, it's you know and it's absolutely key. In doesn't I mean you know it's just a. Uh, I, I totally agree with Jessica. Yeah. It can be made magic. Yeah. yeah. It can be a really mm. wonderful wonderful mm. collaboration, creative collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, more questions, more tweets. Anybody? Over there. Do you mind going to the mic? Person is listening. <laughs> they will be. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, my question is um, when I've looked into funding. Um, opportunities and what exists out there, very often I seem to come across um, the requirement of having had uh, an Australian producer credit uh, with your name in order to apply for further funding. Um, and I have a producer credit that happens to not be in Australia. And I'm sure there's lots of people that probably want to answer to that question who may just not have one full stop, like what's available for them. Thank you. 
you've made a film, not in Australia but somewhere else, but you've still produced something. But um, I've produced it here, but um, it was sold internationally, but it didn't sell in Australia. So, as a no, film here that 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 should be. It was it was it was it's on. Go on. It was <coughs> it was a, it was a self-funded project, so it was it wasn't a commission in the first place. But I guess the point being that it's a project that no one's ever in Australia, no one's heard of because it's sold elsewhere. But you're asking. About if you wanted to approach a funding body or a broadcaster? Well, both. Uh, if you were to approach us with a project at the ABC, I would assume that um, we would ask to have a look at it. That's it. We would just want to have a look at it. Um, and we would base, um, from our point of view, our assessment on that. I don't know um, about funding, whether you need to have a, a screen producer credit. It, there's different initiatives that the funding bodies have, so... You might want to kind of speak to someone there about... There's lots of different pathways. I'm could, not sure could, which one you're talking about. Well, I, I, whenever I've looked things up, whenever mm. things have come up online that I've researched, that seems to be one of the criteria that comes up very often. So could you maybe talk about the um, funding options that are available to people who don't have um, such credit? You're eligible because you already made a film that you ha you already have a credit. Although people don't know about your film, you do have a credit for, if, for as a as a as someone that produced a film. So I, I mean, think what, one of one of the one of the uh, the difficulties um, of working, I think, with with um, old, you know, one of one of the one of the parameters of working with screen agencies and with broadcasters is that is that there's a, there's a whole lot of um, sort of due diligence around, you know, having having a, an entity that they can like a like a um, a, a proprietary limited company where, where you know, that there's, there are structures that if finances are being, you know, administered. Um, so it's often about, I think, forging creative alliances with, with other filmmakers. So, you know, I've worked a lot you know, before I was working at the ABC where filmmakers would, would uh, come to me with an idea that, that, that where they needed the expertise that I had in producing to, uh, to, to collaborate, to have it made. Um, now, the tricky thing there is, is that, that the uh, the rules that the screen agencies uh, um, operate by is that the the production company has to has to have the copyright in in the film. So that means that you would have to hand over your copyright in the film. Is that is that well, not necessarily. no, not necessarily. I mean, Liz, Liz should be talking about this rather than yeah, because Liz Liz is from Screen Australia and, yeah. and is the documentary manager there. So yeah, so so maybe you should talk about that, Liz. Well, <laughs> um, look, there's, as Jessica said, there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different approaches. So we've funded people with very little experience who've got their own production company, who've bought in an executive producer, maintained the copyright in their film because they've used their own company. And we've also funded the scenario that you were talking about. There's, there's lots of different avenues for funding. It's, it's all tough and highly competitive. Uh, Art Bytes is one good example, although it's just shut. The, um, uh, the other one that we've run recently is uh, called Doco 180, which was uh, for sh very short films. Uh, on a platform with um, uh, a, a um, platform for called Women, W H uh, I M N, um, which is a news news dot com uh, platform, and uh, so you know you just have to keep in touch with us. Uh, talk to our development person Alyssa Orvis if you if you're wanting to come in for development, but there are credit requirements absolutely for most um, projects and for most funding. Why did you have credit requirements for the 180 doc? That seemed like a perfect opportunity to, for a 180, like a minute and a half, to give an opportunity to filmmakers who didn't have a credit yet. I was just interested with the 180. So uh, the question was, the question was, why do we have credit requirements? 
the 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 credit requirement was that you have to have some footage somewhere so it wasn't it, it could be anything so you could have a, a youtube clip uh, and that was um, enough we just needed to know that somebody had picked up a camera and had done something with the camera that's all that was the credit requirement there tweet coming in and uh, the, the, could, could we have the tweet first actually other tweets you can have the hashtag is hashtag hashtag ozdocs ozdox there's a um, tweet from Mitzi and it's probably meant for possibly more Bronwyn David is there a growing international market for short docs that's an interesting, well, it's an interesting one. I think that, you know, I'm starting to look at with our catalogue at the moment, I'm looking at things like Condé Nast. I'm looking at more online opportunities for shorts. I mean, here in Australia, we have a channel of, of branded content on iView at the moment. We've got 25 shorts, flick, Australian shorts um, that you can see on I, iView. And we um, also work with Virgin Australia in flight and we have um, programs of shorts on in-flight Australian short films only. Um, but internationally, um, short docs are one of the hardest things to sell. Um, live action, animation, yes. Um, we have markets in Japan, we have markets um, in the US and in Europe, but short docs, it's it's just a really hard, you know, as the markets get smaller and smaller, I think, particularly traditional broadcast, we're gonna see growth in online. Um, as we are seeing here with iView, and that seems to be the way that a lot of the international Canal Plus now are doing shorts online more so than broadcast, for example, and they were a big purchaser um, for a long period of time. But it's still, a, you know, it's a really, really, di still a really difficult um, place to find a commercial avenue for. I think I can say the same for, for longer documentaries, <laughs> uh, not only shorter ones. I think it's, it's generally a really yeah. difficult marketplace mm. yeah, yeah. at the moment. And what yeah. about uh, Charlie Phillips and uh, Guardian that uh, you're going to show? Is he going to speak about, I heard him speaking about uh, it at AADC, sure. about the different possibilities. Okay, let's, let's, before we do, Charlie, there's, there is actually a question from the audience. Do you mind going to the... Um, yeah, Mark, thanks. Yes, hello. Um, thank you very, very much. It's been really informative. I'm a bit of a dinosaur, I suppose, in that generation of people who watched lots of movies with shorts that went on the screen before the main feature. I'm wondering if anybody's aware of that space being explored. Um, uh, we know that online, we know that, you know, from Virgin and all the rest of it, and the possibilities are endless. But I still would personally love to see if there's any evidence of you know, reinvigorating that old tradition of watching a short, especially if it relates to the community that is in the cinema at the time watching the film, so that it's tying into the people and the, the concerns that they may have. Um, yeah. We certainly try. I mean, we've got 52 venues across Australia for Flickerfest and they range everywhere from Kununurra and the outdoor picture garden through to Eden and the Rotary Club. Um, so we work a lot with communities around the country and our tour and touring Australian shorts and we try really, really hard as much as we can to include a local angle within that program. So when we're touring, you know, we've got 10 venues across WA regional centres, we'll take a WA short with us or if we're in the Northern Territory, we'll take a Northern Territory short with us, similarly in Queensland. So we really try to, you know, make it relevant, make the festival relevant and the tour that we do. So we mix it up um, and we try to, you know, give people at least as close to local films as we can. But the I have been approached so many times about the short film before the feature thing and I, I would love to do it. But sadly, if you go to the cinema these days, after you've sat through, a, a, you know, 45 minutes of trailers um, and ads and everything else um, before you even get to the feature film that you've purchased the ticket to see, I think all of that, I, I just, whenever I try to talk to cinemas about it, the main thing that I get told is that that's commercial time that they've sold. And so putting a, a short film in would mean that, that they wouldn't make the money anymore and they can't see any commercial value in that so sadly um, I don't think that's going to happen anytime 
soon outside of festivals, <laughs> outside of festivals and you know what we're trying to do with touring the shorts etc around the country grind you know does Gil, does Gil ever curate stuff you know barnstorming kind of around distri- no no distributing Not so much he's m- m- he's got a bit of an in with um, municipal libraries uh, right, right. and that's that's his uh, big market at the mm-hmm. stage but it's hard yeah Really it's been a thing that we've always tried to do for a long, long time is convince exhibitors to put on short films. Yeah. Unless there's some sort of gov- regulation that, that tells them they've got to do it, they won't do it. Do. Um, yeah, not <laughs> we've got to wait for the Labour Party to get in. <laughs> um, look, I'd really like to show Charlie Phillips now. I think uh, it's, it's only like a five or six minute piece, but I think it will be quite important for people who really are interested in... Uh, finding more of a global market for their short, short doc, because this is what The Guardian does. Yeah, so Guardian Documentaries is our project to commission short, original documentaries. We do a series of docs of approximately 20 minutes, although they can be a little bit shorter and a little bit longer. And the idea behind them is to get some of the best stories around the world made by independent filmmakers that that are going to kind of complement our news coverage, complement our written and audio material by just showcasing really great documentary storytelling. But as far as possible, we want films that have a beginning, a middle and an end, that have a complete narrative arc that take you on a journey. Um, We're open to lots of different ways of doing that, but ultimately it needs to feel like you would keep watching our docs for 20 minutes on the Guardian website where there's a lot of distractions and and that you would keep feeling involved in them. Um, We really want global stories, so we really look for people who have access to people, places, situations in parts of the world where, or parts of society where we might struggle to get access. Um, and we also want things that are going to work online, which basically means they need to be told at relatively fast pace, um, really strong openings, um, something that keeps you watching every 30 seconds or so. You know, it's not a formula, but we just want really engaging things. And the kind of things we do need to, you know, they're, they're not news, they're not journalism, they're not current affairs necessarily, but they need to complement the rest of our news and journalism offering so it should feel like there's a reason you're watching this thing on on the guardian website so broadly it should be within the very wide scope of things that the guardian covers um and we want contemporary stories as well so we don't do history we we want things that tell you something new and surprising about the world today Mm. would you look for um documentaries from australia do you think yeah, I mean, I look for films from anywhere, so I'm always really interested in hearing ideas wherever I am. Um, but the advantage that Aussie filmmakers have is that, although we've got an office in Sydney and a smaller office in Melbourne, we don't really commission very much original video out of those Australian offices. So practically, the, it's very hard for us to get compelling stories told you know, at length and with quality ourselves so we really do look for Australian filmmakers to bring us ideas and I don't get enough short ideas pitched to me from Australian filmmakers we are doing one film um, with an Australian team that's going out shortly but other than that it's it's kind of rare and and I'd love to hear people's ideas. So how did you commission or do you buy um, already? So we, we, we almost always commission um, and we like to get involved quite early so that we can help shape the story make sure it's going to work for the guardian um, make sure that we can be involved all the way through the process and to, to shape it to be really perfect and, and work collaboratively with filmmakers and it's much harder to do that when someone presents us with a completed short because fundamentally this, it's just hard for us to have input into that really um, we do do a selection of films that are versions of what will become longer feature docs and and the filmmakers approach me with that you know in full transparency that that's what they're going to try and do but mostly we're into original shorts and and then if if it's going to be a feature later down the line we can have that conversation when the short's finished but I just want to be able to focus on the short with the filmmaker and it has to be a standalone short It, it can't be a compressed version of a longer film.
So what have been the most successful ones that have gone out? Um, so we did a film called Gun Nation that was about guns in America, made by a British filmmaker. Um, that did really well, it was half an hour long, it's a beautiful film, it's been nominated for awards. Um, we, I know one of the older films we did when we were doing slightly shorter ones was a film called Too Black for Brazil that was about a Brazilian carnival queen who was regarded as being too black skinned. Um, that did incredibly well on social media, especially in Brazil. Um, one, one that I'm really fond of is Radical Brownies, which is about um, a group of, um, a sort of alternative youth group for girls of colour in Oakland, California. Um, I'm very, very fond of a film we've got coming up next week, actually, so I don't know if it'll be successful, I hope it will, uh, which is about trolls and internet commenters all over the world. So, you know, I, we, we obviously are very... We put, a, we put a lot of stock in what views our films get, but for me, success is based around it just being a really, really great film, and that's more important to me than, you know, a lot of other things. Um, we like to get a sense of place in the films, we like to have a really great sense of character that you get to know in a deep level and empathise with. Um, and we also really like films that are non-judgmental and, and this really, really matters to me that we, you know, we're not condemning or condoning people in our films, that it's, it really is the kind of observational aesthetic where we leave our audience to form their own judgments. And, you know, that kind of differs from what you might expect from a news organisation or you know, from, certainly from a journalism organisation because they are independent voices and so we want people's responses to the films to feel quite independent as well. Okay, so what do people do um, when they have some really good, strong ideas? Mm. How do they contact you? Um, so they should send me a treatment that is one to two pages tells me as much as possible about what we're going to see on screen so I'm much more interested in the you know, description of your visual storytelling than loads and loads of background information because we can talk about the background later or I can find it out myself um, and then I also want like teaser really good teaser trailer visual material just something I can look at to complement the written material the, the the ideal time for me to come in is when Filmmakers have shot something, so I can get a sense of your style if I don't know you. I can get a sense of um, your characters and your stories. Um, so it's not, not so early that it just seems completely conceptual, but not so late that it's all in the can and you're not going to go back and shoot more. So, so totally, like, like sort of, you know, late development, early production is a good stage for me. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, Our thanks. Also oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, we can just reform the panel for the very end. Um, we don't have too long to go. Maybe another 10, 15 minutes. Um, Tom, yep. can you tell us what the, the Guardian is offering in terms of money? Uh, I've heard that, uh, that sure. Um, the question was how much money would the Guardian offer in terms of a commission? Uh, I've heard they can offer up to 30,000 Australian dollars, which is pretty good for something around 20 minutes. Between 16 and 25 is their ideal length. And as, as you heard, they're interested in largely character-driven contemporary stories, um, more actuality-based. In many ways, a kind of compression of a, of a longer doc <laughs> in a shorter space of time. You know, and they're interested in, you know, a, the comment he made about uh, uh, pace was, it, <laughs> you know, it needs to be fairly fastly paced, F fast paced rather. Um, although I did ask him a question, well, can it slow down at any point? Yeah, it can slow down for a little while. <laughs> pace up, pace up again. But uh, I mean, at the AIDC, one evening was devoted to um, him screening a whole lot of documentaries. Um, uh, in Federation Square, so everybody sort of sat back in armchairs and watched the docks, which is kind of quite a, a nice evening. But you can simply get onto their website and see see what they they're actually currently been commissioning and um, running. And you have a world audience. I mean, an audience of hundreds of thousands of people. Mm. Actually, I just thought of one thing that we we um, 
we uh, took as an acquisition last year, which was a really uh, one out of the box, really, which was called One Day for Peace, which was a really lovely piece made by the Urban Theatre Project. I don't know if any of you are familiar yeah. with their work. They work. They, op they operate out of Bankstown, and they they made these. Um, they made a, made a. I think it was thirty six minutes long, and it was it was designed to be shown what big on big multiple screens in Parramatta and Auburn. And it was literally screening as people walked through the, uh, you know, on the, drifting through on their way in lunchtime, going to work. Um, and uh, it was just this really lovely meditation on people's different beliefs. Um, and it was like a sort of collage of, uh, of um, people from all over the western suburbs of Sydney, um, Sikhs, Buddhists, Christians, Baha'i people, Muslims, all kinds of, of faith traditions, um, sort of quietly going about their lives, and it had a really lovely meditative quality. Now, you know, that's not that's not the sort of usual thing that you would see on um, telly, uh, but I felt like it was it was just a really lovely piece, and and they they worked they were very happy to work to to, to cut it down to, to suit, and um, and it was it was people really loved it, you know. So they you know that's something. That was unusual, you know, that we that we acquired and. Did it have any narrative, or was it just simply no. watching? No, I, had, uh, they, I mean there were people talking. Uh, talking to camera. Yeah, a little bit to camera. Um, yeah, there were they, there, there were some people talking to camera, but but it was also it also had sort of an observational kind of element. It was and it was very yeah. it was very slow paced. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but people really loved it. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm. Oh, there's a question there from Brendan. Hi, um, I'm just interested to hear your opinions on where the best opportunities for beginning filmmakers lie as far as developing or starting their careers. Should they be aiming for the festivals or should they be aiming for online platforms? And how has the, the growth of online um, platforms influenced the style of content that you are seeing? Me to well, that. well, I mean, all of you, because obviously yeah. you're coming from very different backgrounds. I mean, I think festivals, you know, I always say to people, obviously, that's a question I get asked a lot, why festivals? Why shouldn't I just put my film up online? And I say, well, there's a whole lot of, um, you know, funny kitten videos and everything else that you need to wade through before you can get to any content that's curated or that you might want to watch. And so... You know, I, I think that what we try and do at Flickrfest is certainly to wade through the two and a half thousand entries and to get that down to a curated experience for people where they know that we've put months and months and months of our selection committee um, and our programming team have put a lot of, you know, time and effort. I mean, Pat Fisk, for example, who's here's been on our selection committee, we've got lots of... Um, long time um, film industry people that watch the films for Flickrfest every year and, and volunteer to help us to get through that volume of work. So, you know, I certainly think that festivals are a great place to start for short documentary makers, but if you got commissioned by The Guardian, I'd say go for that. You know what I mean? Because I just think if you've got a, a platform and a, a big masthead that's going to support your work, then, you know, and or, you know, Art Bites on the ABC or or a, or someone that can give you that exposure to an audience and go for that. But if you're just going to make work to put up yourself on the internet, I think that's a bad move um, because I think people are going to find it very hard to find you amongst all the other noise that's there. So that's possibly how I see where festivals work and then where other curated experience of work can really benefit you as a filmmaker. Uh, I, um, you know, we try to do lots of different things at the ABC. We try to serve lots of different communities and, um, you know, in entertainment they've had a lot of initiatives. So what I'm saying is there's there are two paths. You could look out for those initiatives. Um, you know, entertainment had a whole bunch of initiatives recently look, looking for um, comedians and people, I think it was the Fresh Blood series where people um, could submit ideas. There was a whole bunch that that were road tested and the one that did best they selected. We're constantly actually trying to find find new directors, find new producers, filmmakers. We, we want to open up access more. It's just very difficult. We get inundated with proposals from people right across the country in all kinds of demographics with all kinds of ideas. But the ABC is very, very keen, keenly watching what's coming through. It's one of the reasons that we do partnerships with um, 
organizations like Flickr to have some of those that content on um, on iview we try to get to festivals we try to do all that kind of stuff to try and find the new that's why we did art bites was to try and find new emerging filmmakers and I know the screen funding industry uh, bodies are the same uh, but to contradict slightly what Brom was saying, it was really interesting recently, you know, we get sent emails with all kinds of documents of, um, you know, how they measure audience minute by minute and this way and that way and all different ways that they measure audience. And the other day I got one through that was um, YouTube stars and it was just like this huge document that some marketing organisation had done and I don't know whether someone at the ABC bought it or how it came into my inbox but it was brought, broken down into different genres and it was just like a page each of this is who this YouTube person is, this is what they do, this is their audience, here's a clip. And um, so we do look at YouTube stuff. I think that's how the catering show mm. came to be. That's how Bondi Hipsters came to be. Um, you know, you, you all know the story of the Bondi Hipsters. They put out a video on YouTube. It got a lot of attention. It got our attention. So I wouldn't totally discount it. I know you're oh, in a bit, it's busy, yeah, busy, busy. Yeah, I just busy. think it's a web series. Um, yeah, well, they, obviously Bondi Hipsters is a web series. The mm. catering show mm. was a web series and they had a reasonable amount of experience in the industry. Oh, but or, I think Bondi Hipsters started with just one video that, mm. um, the I can't remember his name now. Does anyone remember it? Anyway. Christian, Christian Van, Van Buren. Buren. Yeah, he did, this is just one video, mm. one piece to camera. Um that started so mm. that's how it started and it and it and just keep and in, be, be involved in the industry go to industry events like you are today read the industry publications you know those sorts of connections being around is really worthwhile yeah I mean, one of the interesting things too to think about what's coming down the track very soon is i mean you know i i was talking to a couple of 11 year olds recently they 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 watch youtube red and you know there's a whole massive amount of content there that's being being made specifically you know for that that platform and um those kids don't watch anything else they don't watch they don't watch abc me they don't they watch everything everything they watch is on youtube red and um that's you know sort of standalone platform that's you know offering offering stacks of content you know it's interesting is anyone making, is anyone making any money though <laughs> Yeah, yeah. In kids, in kids, kids, they are. Yeah, yeah. And I think there, there are people making making a lot of money. Yeah, mm -hmm. through advertising. Yeah. Cool. I made a good. Okay, there's actually a tweet here that, um, which I'll just um, just throw to, to the panel. Um, what about uh, short interstitials? Interstitials. Minute or less. Are they viable broadcast for broadcast or as a miniseries for te safe television? Uh, yeah, um, I'm not sure what the status of interstitials is at the moment. I think less and less. Uh, the, you know, with I think ABC Two would you know, we we commissioned an interstitial interstitial series a few years ago called The Lost Tools of Henry Hoke, which was 24 times five minutes about a mythical um, character called Henry Hoke. Um, we're talking in arts about commissioning a series of one-minute films, um, but they I don't know that they have a place on the broadcaster anymore. They tend to get a bit lost there, which is comes back to the festival thing. You do kind of want that stuff curated, and that's why iView is so fantastic, because even if those that content does get made and put, I mean, we're going to get more people watching broadcast, no matter what. But we're less and less putting them in between programs because they do sort of disappear and trying to curate them on iView. All right. Any more questions, please, for the panel? There's a couple there. Um, you first, yeah, thanks. Hi, continuing sort of in the online arena, is there consideration in, uh, well, in the festival and broadcasts and the digital cousin of broadcasts in multi-platform documentaries? Is that something that, if you're going to make that, would it need to be re-edited for? those channels or is that something that will may come up in the future? Uh, sorry? 
I think it's for you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, I'm just trying to, yeah, I don't, I don't actually know. I don't, yeah. Um, yeah. There is. <laughs> I, I know for, for where I'm sitting um, right now, uh, I'm thinking in terms of multi-platform. I'm thinking in terms of how um, I can create one thing that does reach out to different platforms because different platforms have different audiences or, uh, or different ways of, of getting in touch with your audience. And so I think now um, I am definitely thinking in terms of what is the best way to get um, an audience to the, the, the one key thing that I'm making and there might be quite odd ways on, on the outskirts that that is achieved through using multi-platform. And going back to the question um, about uh, on digital or festivals, I think you really have to ask yourself what's your personal measure of success for that particular project and it all might be different. Um, sometimes you might be uh, looking for... Uh, uh, just wanting to get it out there um, and, and just getting it out there, then digital. Sometimes you might uh, really need the legitimacy before you put it out there. Um, and so you need to just ask yourself that. And sometimes it might be the process of, of going through the channels of trying to do the best you possibly can with it and then it might end up somewhere else. But then, it, you know, it, that doesn't matter. You know, you... It, things find a natural place for themselves also. I think, um, I'm just thinking about, you know, I was just trying to sort of think about it in relation to, to the, the kind of compass world. And just getting back to that, that one screen last Saturday being changed, um, that is, in its feature, uh, ver the feature version, had a really, really successful season, I think, at the cinema in Marimbula because it was it was really focused around local community. So there were a lot of people who went went to that to see it. And it, was, it kept on being extended because so many people kept on coming to see it. Um, and that's a f that that's and that's so that's had it's had that life and I'm sure it will it will go on to have uh, other you know screenings as, as, it, as a feature doc, and then for us there's the half hour version, um, and then you know there's been a, a you know a shorter a, a, when I say shorter I mean much shorter version of, of it uh, specifically for social media that we that our social media team put together as well as as um, various other extras you know so I mean that when I think about multi platform that's that's sort of that's what I'm thinking about in relation to multi-platform in, in, in terms of the, the because of the, the the world in which we make stuff is is kind of limited by the broadcast schedule and stuff. But that, that doesn't mean that programs don't don't have. Uh, it's actually you know. a very similar uh, example. Remember, um, Mary and meets Muhammad, or Mary oh, and yeah, Muhammad, yeah, Mary which Muhammad, was exactly yeah. the same yeah, thing. Yeah, the filmmaker, in fact, she she was here talking about social impact yeah. last year or the yeah. year before massive uh, number of screenings through Tasmania. So it's a refugee story. Yeah. And then she eventually brought it to to you yeah. and, and then yeah. well, I was at Compass. And then to me as a as an EP. Yeah. Yep. And got down to twenty minutes. Could you imagine how she felt getting her film down from eighty five <laughs> down to twenty five minutes. Very resistant but then realised, hang on, I can get my you know, my message to a lot more people and it ended up being very successful. Multi-platform, so multi-platform is a, 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 a huge appeal to the ABC and I suspect to SBS as well. Um, the big buzzwords for us, uh, you know, finding audiences where they are, like taking material to content to where the audiences want to receive it and whether that means, you know, an app, a website, mm -hmm. a social media, you know, was, that's definitely worth considering the different iterations of your project. But, you know, the platforms change all the time and I worked on a project that was a massive multi-platform thing a few years ago and by the time we kind of got it all together and got it on the road it was a website primarily and suddenly no one was looking at websites everyone was looking at apps and we're like eh, you know so it, th that space changes a lot um but yeah definitely think in those terms it's very smart there's one one uh, word that i keep hearing around the corridors not the abc at the moment is is scalable you know having a scalable idea you know so something something that could you know start small and and then you know go large so you know, have have lots of different potential to yes. yeah yeah which is what charlie phillips was talking about the idea of pitching a film a small film but but keeping in mind that possibly it could grow beyond mm -hmm. that yeah. So it's again versioning. You know, it's it's all a movable phase. Yeah. There was another question, I think, from somebody in the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Do you mind going to the mic? Thanks. Hi. 
Hi. Um, I was wondering if there's much scope for um, organisations in Australia who are looking for material to collaborate with organisations in other countries. And I was wondering how strong, like, the relationships are between different countries and which countries do we have the strongest relationship to produce material for is. Broadcasters? No, um, not necessarily broadcasting, but in terms of being able to arrange production and permissions. Mm. There's still, there's still, do we still, do we still have those, there's those relationships? What are they called? The, you know, the, the accords, the accords with treaties, co-production treaties? Yeah. There is a list on mm. yeah, Canada is probably, for documentary, Canada is one of the best mm. and, and the UK. And is there much scope for Australian documentaries to reach those markets? Producers are doing international deals all the time. And uh, so, yes, there, there is markets for Australian documentaries and there are either official co-productions uh, or unofficial or co-financing. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's the way to go. It's such an important part of filmmaking these days and it can happen on a multi-platform level as well. Great. Now, I think we're just about to wind up. Um, one final question. That's all we've got time for. Yes, is somebody leaving or, or, or are you about to? <laughs> I think they're going. All right. Why don't we then wind up the session? I want to thank our fantastic panel. You've been really brilliant. I think the, I think the discussion has been really <laughs> wide ranging. Um, but. Before we wind up, I just want to film. The, uh, sorry, thank the projectionist, Alan Butterfield, Peter Butterworth, the studio control of the streaming, film school for supplying the theatre, Australian Directors Guild, and our next Ausdocs is scheduled for, for during to be during the film festival. It's going to be more like a social event, but a bit of a sort of party. And before I forget, thanks Amber McBride for being involved also in um, organising the panel and the ideas. Um, so I'll, we'll see you in June or perhaps in July. Great. <laughs> right.